So we're, as we've been finishing up talking about um, the Pardes, which is basically the uh, exegesis or the study of interpreting the scriptures. And it's like just what I've been saying for the past few weeks is that we have a weird uh, Western American version of reading and understanding the scriptures and we lose a lot of its power. We lose a lot of its power because of our interpretation of what we're reading. So I kind of went through a little nerdy, you know, academical approach to it, understanding what what tools we could use to go deeper into the Word of God. Because everybody likes to rely on just a revelation and, and just, you know, whatever the Holy Spirit says. But then yet, how's that working out? Because you still have more questions than you have answers. It's because you can kind of, I can read you a playbook on how to play football. And you can memorize that playbook until you actually get on the field and have other team members playing with you. When the quarterback goes hike, you got to know what to do. And that's kind of hard to do when you just read something and you get it all in you. You have to actually be out there on the field to experience it. And so understanding what, oh, okay, that's what that means, a little X and go like this. Okay, now I get it because then things change when you're out there in the field. So right now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna kind of go out there in the field from what we've been putting together. And I want to take one of my most um, beloved uh, messages and sermons the Lord gave me with the revelation because this is, again, we have read this text, and I mean the text meaning the Bible, over and over and over again. I bet you any one of us can quote a gazillion scriptures, and um, we can tell you how many times we've heard it uh, and what it means to you, all that good stuff. But if you don't get the underlying remez, um, Peshat, the salt, and the rash, if you don't get like the meaning, the meat of it all, you're going to miss so much stuff. And like the Bible says, um, can I get some scraps off the table? And then Jesus says, what, you know, why should I give you the scraps? And he goes, well, even the dog, I'm sorry, why should I give you the meat? And the woman says, well, even the dog gets scraps. And it's in that, you guys, I was like, all right, okay. Now you read that, it's not like, what's so good about that? What's so particular about that? Because you don't know the culture, you don't understand the full ramifications of what that means. It's like almost, um, like I've been saying this past few weeks, that if you live in a town or a city that's got that one favorite spot that isn't really popular, but everybody knows about it, and everybody loves the food, uh, but if you just say that one little phrase, like Lucy's or Tommy's or Joe's, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But 50 years down the line, no one's going to know who... You know, Tommy's was. They're not going to know that unless it's recorded somewhere or unless you understand the culture of that time, of, uh, uh, that, of that environment. You're not going to really, you're going to miss a lot of the importance of what that means. If I just said, oh, there's this one place that we used to, we, we used to go love to eat. It was just a great place. You're going to think, oh, okay, you know, McDonald's, Wendy's, Chili's, oh, Applebee's. You know what I mean? So you're going to kind of like let your mind wander. But all those people in the know know about that one great spot down that street. They're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't know, you're never going to get the full impact of what that means. And so that's one reason why I want to share with you something that has been like um, uh, helpful for me. Because like I said, the main objective, the, the bottom line, the goal, the target is to fall more madly in love with Jesus than I've ever been before. And by falling more madly in love with them, you got to know who he is. You've got to know who we're dating. You just can't sit there and go, oh, he's a nice guy, or he's, he's a pretty girl. Uh -huh, she's funny. You know, whatever. She cleans. You know, that's great. You know, then, no, there's, some, there's more than just the way she looks and how she cleans, or the way he looks and how he, you know, he, he provides. It's more than that. I'm going to take a little bunny trail. When we see people who are, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from being from the married perspective. <clears throat> when I was a single guy 30 some odd years ago, the people in my environment was, the questions were, as far as qualifications or requirements, was, does this spouse share your same vision in ministry? Does this, this I'm sorry, that's about, does this person you want to date, this prospect, save your, uh, share your same goals and objectives? Does this potential uh, spouse have the same passion you do? Does your uh, potential uh, spouse or partner um, 
have the same uh, uh, desires as you. That's what you know we were kind of dealing with. So we would you know find somebody we were particularly interested in and say, so how do you feel about ministering the gospel in Jesus in, in Detroit, Michigan? I mean, that was like that's the question. It wasn't like. So what's your sign or what do you do? It was like, so what are your thoughts on evangelizing in, in the ghettos of India? I mean, that's, that's where, now, that's not really a lot to build a relationship on because you can, you can have somebody who can agree with you um, ministry base, but then together when you're at home and you're always fighting, that's a problem. That's a problem. So there's always that, that the mixture or the, the combination of what you feel intimately and what you do globally. Basically, what do you do personally inside, you know, heart to heart, and then what do you do outside, hand to hand? That's where the, the beauty of it coming together. So, one particular person that um, I felt was really kind of not, uh, how can I put this? <laughs> uh, the, the, frame, the frame of mind wasn't the right place. Uh, this woman would say, I like him. I said, okay, why, why do you like him? And she said, because he has a nice car. You like him because he have a nice car. So I said, "What if he loses his car? What if he, what if the, what if the car crashes and he, he can't drive any longer?" I said, uh, "Oh well, okay, I, well that'd be fine, I guess." But that was her first thought. That was her first thought process. What kind of car he drives? And then the next part was, "Well, how much money does he make?" So she's looking at all the material aspects of what kind of car does he drive. And uh, well, first was the looks, which, which kind of you know, there's there's an attraction. You got you have to have an attraction. Don't let's not. Let's not play games. You, there needs to be an attraction. There's an attraction. Then her first reaction was, what kind of car is he driving and how much money he makes? Now, that is a part of it. I, don't get me wrong. Please, I understand that. You know, that's, that's important to some people. But having that job, driving that car, having those looks, one day the looks will fade away, the car will break down, and the, the, the finances may potentially disappear. Then what's left? Then what's left over? That's what I'm talking about. Taking away all the foo-foo, as I call, I call it the foo-foo. Taking away all the foo-foo, the meat and potatoes is what's left over. I remember when I was in India, I went to this little village where there was a, just literally a bunch of, that was a little, you, you, would, almost, you would almost even say it was lunchtime at an a elementary school. Because all I saw was, 12-year-old kids and under, all playing and running around and uh, just doing weird things. And by, by weird things, I mean like um, preparing a shelter or making food or something like that. And so I thought, wow, look at a bunch of, uh, you know, active kids. And the pastor said, this little community of all these little kids, these are all married couples. And I laughed because I thought, no way, these kids are barely 11, 12 years old. There's no way. There's no way. And he said, yeah. But what the parents have done is they've said they can't afford a child. So as soon as the, the woman starts, the little girl starts to have her, her menstrual cycle um, and then tell her, the little 13-year-old boy, this is now your wife. I'll take $50. And he'll take 50 U.S. dollars. And now those two now are a married couple. And then the, the parents will say, here, go take care of your wife, you lazy thing. Go ahead, provide for your wife. Do whatever you can. Take care of it. Feed your family. And so they put this responsibility on these little kids. So these little 11, 12 year, 13 year old boys are out there trying to hustle whatever they can to go get food to bring home to their wife. And I'm sitting there going like, that is never going to last. And then the pastor tells me, well, it's been lasting for quite a while. This is sometimes how we do it here in India. And we've had couples that have lasted for years. And I'm sitting there going, based upon that premise in the beginning, where somebody just said, here, this person, that person. And I thought about that. And the Lord was showing me, obviously, obviously, it's not the ideal scenario. But from that point of, but that from that perspective, from where they are in that culture, where they grew up in, these two kids grew up together. They grew up with one focus, one goal, and basically survival. But it is in that that they were able to put the money together, put their resources together, build a home, eventually build a home, and then build a family, and not have to worry about what their parents and grandparents told them. They can go ahead and better their lives. And then they stay married. I'm sort of going like, that is the most bizarre thing. But what the Lord was showing me was, it wasn't so much as, as far as the physical or the natural. It was all about the survival of the, 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 the survival of them as a couple, survival of them as, as 
as a person, as a people, and they were able to share that growth together. So yeah, we have we we have a little bit more, you know, the American uh, dichotomy as far as our culture and our environment. We we're, we're not we're not in the Middle Ages, but we've gotten to the point now where looks and money and prestige speaks more than the inward part and and we take that type of structure framework and put it into the kingdom of god i heard one man say he said that people who oh, if i can get this if i can quote this correctly he said people who don't have a lot of money like to buy expensive things because even though they don't have that wealth they like to wear shoes, like Nike shoes, uh, carry on, you know, uh, 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 Jimmy Choo shoes or, or an expensive purse to walk around to give them the impression they are living that lifestyle. So they'll spend $1,000 on a pair of shoes, but not have enough food to, to, uh, for food to eat for the rest of the month because they'd rather walk around to show people that, look what I can afford. But in reality, it's like, look, what I'm, look, well, look at what I don't have. And I thought that was so, so really, look at what I don't have. Look at what I don't have. I thought that was so interesting. So I'm saying not to say this. When we read the word of God, we're showing people, look at what I don't have. We're quoting the scriptures. We're going through the motions. But we have, we're limited in the power. We are limited in the power that it yields us from us because we'd rather look like we got the power than actually have the power. And that's where the disconnect comes in. So I want to kind of share with you a little uh, connecting of the disconnect that would help you and I look a little further down the line so you can be at peace. Now, all that to say, I'm sorry, I took a long bunny trail. This is one of those messages that where God helped me put the pieces together. And it's a message I love preaching. It's entitled, The Wheat, the Wine, and the Oil, uh, The Secret Weapons of God. And you might say, huh? Isn't, wouldn't that be the sword, the javelin, and, and, the, uh, and the bullet or something? The wheat, the wine, and the oil. The sod of it all. And we talked about the sod being that secret, that little hidden mystery. The wheat, and the wine, and the oil. Now, I told you before. Now, let me just really quick, just to kind of, I'm, I don't want to beat down the refresh again, but let's, for the sake of refreshing, we talk about the pochette, which is actually the literal word for word translation. We talk about the remez, which is the hint or the allegory, uh, allegorical meaning of a word, like I'm hungry like a horse. Well, you're not going to actually eat a horse, so what it represents. And then there's the dirash, which is where we get the study or the inquire of the Lord. If you see a phrase in the Bible written again and again and again, that is telling you that Focus on this, focus on this, focus on this. If you hear a phrase, like for example in Genesis where it says, and the Lord and the Lord created such and such, and it was good. And the Lord said, and it was good. So you see that phrase, and it was good, so many times it resonates within you to where God likes this. God's in this. God's a part of that because I keep hearing this reference. And it was good. And it was good. You don't have to keep saying that, but because it's written there, it's meaning something. It's got a little more deeper meaning. This is when the Bible says when uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham, uh, I'm sorry, when uh, uh, Sarah had Isaac, um, it was good. It was saying that God was in this. Are you with me? So every time there's a phrase, and you've heard me say before, and he lifted up his eyes, and he lifted up his head, it's not so much as that he went like this. That meant he saw in the spirit realm. And it's in that, when you keep hearing that phrase, you know exactly what that means. So if you keep hearing the phrase, the wheat and the wine and the oil in scripture, if, you, if that, that, that keeps getting repeated, you know that's, that's like a little, uh, we would say, highlighted yellow, focus on this. So highlighting it in yellow, we're talking about the wheat, the wine and the oil, the sowed or the mystery of it all. In Joel, chapter 2, verse 21, it goes, Fear not, O land, 
Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the wine do yield their strength. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for has given you the former rain. Say former rain. Moderately, and you will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Now, did you notice something there? He kept reiterating the former rain, the rain, and the latter rain. The former rain, latter rain, rain. And that's called a chiasm. Every time you see a chiasm, that's like God taking, a, or the, the writer taking a highlighter and highlighting that in yellow because he wants you to focus on that. Verse 24, and the floors shall be full of wheat. Say wheat. And the fats shall overflow with wine. Say wine. And oil. Say oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the cake worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And they will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see dreams. Your young men will see visions. And, and upon your servants and upon your maidservants in those days will I pour, pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth. Blood and fire, pillar and smoke. So we can see here. Now, if you notice something in this passage of scripture, what do we start talking about? We see that Joel is, is is prophesying what the Lord is telling him to say, and he's speaking to a bunch of people who have, at this point in time, have felt shame and 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 issues and calamity and disaster. So we talked about the historical contextual hermeneutics, like who's who's talking and who's he talking to. So Joel is talking to a bunch of a bunch of people to the Jews who have been beat down, uh, ashamed, uh, ridiculed, persecuted, all, all that, all that stuff. He's trying to give them a word of encouragement. And he starts off by saying, you know what? I'm going to cause, man, the um, the wheat to grow. I'm going to cause the, the vats to, to burst out with new wine. I'm going to cause oil to flow. And then after all that, he's talking about food. And then he goes, I'm going to feed you. you get, and then all of a sudden, something switches and he says, Oh, and by the way, your sons and I will prophesy. <laughs> I'll pour up my spirit for all flesh. I, and your sons and I will prophesy. Um, and then your mates, everything that had I'll, I'll pour up my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and earth below. So how in the world is he equating food with the power, supernatural power of God? How, why would he make that comparison of saying, starting up by saying, it's like basically, let me, put it in, let me put it in plain terminology. If I were to tell you and say, hey, Kevin, man, I know you've been through some mess, man, but I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to buy you everything from McDonald's, man. I'm going to buy you Big Macs. I'm going to buy you fries. I'm going to get you some shakes, man. Oh, I'm not going to prophesy and cast out devils. It's like, what? Like, Where did that come from? You're talking about food and provision. And all of a sudden, you switch the script. And are you talking about the power of God? About uh, prophesying? What does that have to do with my Wheaties? I mean, like, what? It's interesting that that, that that dichotomy as he puts it together because you're kind of probably, for us, we're reading this going, okay, that was a change of thought. That was a weird little transition there. Okay. You're talking about making sure that my 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 wheat and my grain is overflowing. And then you switch it up by saying, and you're going to prophesy. Like, how in the world did you put those two together? Because that's a soul. That's something hidden in that that we missed. And, of course, we always fo focused, and we've heard it a thousand times mentioned about, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And da, 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 da. We read that part, and that's what we focused on. You know why? Because, like I told you before, the Jews are notorious for hiding things in plain sight. You read that, the floor at verse 24, and the floor shall burst, oh, I'm sorry, shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow of wine and oil. He skipped over that part and went right down to the whole... I will pour up my spirit of all flesh, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men shall see dreams, and your young men shall see visions. But you missed the first part of it, because you know why? They thought, that doesn't go together. Okay, so we're reading this in context, we need to throw that part out. No, you can't throw that part out. Throw that pal out. Throw that part out. You can't do that. It's together. It's combined. And I'm going to show you why. Are you ready? A few things.
rain. Read the scripture, uh, verse 223. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your uh, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain, say former rain, moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Like I said, that's a chiasm, which means that he's repeating the pattern of of saying the same thing. And if you repeat a pattern, remember now, we're not talking about a um a, a typewriter or a keyboard. This is some dude with a pen in his hand carving these little letters. So he's, he's not trying to uh, add bold font and underline and circled with a big old yellow marker. He has to let the, the reader know, oh, I want you to focus on this without having a highlighter scribbling yellow and orange all over the paper. This is the way they do so, by repeating the pattern or repeating a phrase so you go back to it and refer back to it. This is the highlighted focus part. Uh, he is giving the former rain moderately, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's a chiasm. Now here's the cool part. The former rain, say former rain. In the Hebrew, it means an archer or a teacher. Did you know that? That's what the word means. The root word means archer or teacher. It is also the sign of evangelism. The si I'm sorry, the sign of teacher. The teacher, the symbolic symbol of the teacher is rain. Did you know that? Just, just so we're clear, apostle is the lion, eagle is the prophet, um, uh, the finger, uh, the hand is the evangelist, um, and the uh, um, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, uh, pastor, uh, pastor, the shepherd is the teacher, I'm sorry, the shepherd is the pastor, and the teacher is falling rain. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so former rain is a teacher, or the teaching. That word rain, again, let me back let me back up again. So when we read that, we say, we read, former rain moderately, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. But there are three different separate words that he mentions here. The first one is the teacher. The second one is actually rain shower. And then we have the third one, which is eloquence. Three separate words. But the way it was translated, it was translated in the same word, rain. But we have three different ver uh, tra literal, literal uh, transliterations of that same word. It's not just rain, rain, rain. It is archer, teacher, shower, rain, rain, shower, and eloquence. Three separate words. So here's Andrea's version of that same scripture with the new, with the new terminology. Be glad, then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For, for he has given you the earlier teaching moderately, and it will cause to come down, and it will cause for it to come down on you like a light shower. The earlier teaching and the eloquent, better teaching in the first month. Which means, my brothers and my sisters, you got that first teaching when you first got saved. It was okay. It got you saved. It came down lightly. But now we're going to go deeper into the word of God. We're going to go deeper into that place where it's going to be more eloquent. Ha! more richer first you had the light rain the light teaching now you're going to get the deeper richer teaching <laughs> see how that changes things it changes things because it's letting you know that what you have been hurt what you have been reading what you have been what has been taught to you you're about to go deeper it the, the first teachings came lightly came subtly but now you and i god is leading you and i into a more eloquent more richer more deeper, more pronounced teaching. So, let's talk about the wheat, as we were talking about the wheat, the wine, and the oil. First of all, we understand it's used to make flour and then bread. And it speaks about creativity. In fact, even, you probably, I'm going to just share this again real fast, but only because I, I just like sharing this. Everything else that God created, he created in Genesis was yay and amen. It was done. Perfection. He created the birds. He created the animals. He created basically the cow, the steak, the chicken, the eggs. Everything that was already done has already been created. So when you talk about bread, you've got to take, first of all, flour with some water, a little bit of oil, mix it together, and then bake it to cook something new. It is not, bread is not a natural byproduct. It doesn't just grow wild. You don't see any bread trees. 
You don't see bread that grows up from the ground. You don't see a, a, a chicken laying some bread loaves. No. And that takes a little bit of creativity to put some stuff together to, voila, create some bread. Now, imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine you are this uh, pre-Adamic or pre-man state or even after Adamic, after the flood type individual. Oh, I'm sorry, before you know, in Genesis type of individual. And you go, hey, let me mix this with some of this and do like this and put it into, I don't know, some fire and it becomes a loaf of bread? Are you kidding me? That's, I mean, you would think that would be witchcraft. You would think that would be sorcery. It would blow your mind, but that's what, God, come on, somebody. That's what speaks about the creativity of God. When the first people to see bread, when they took some wheat and they took some oil, or uh, some yeast, and they took some oil and some water, put it together, put it in the fire, and out comes a delicious loaf of bread? Are you kidding me? It must have just been like, <gasps> mind-blowing. But that's what the Word of God is, y'all. It's mind-blowing. <laughs> so bread speaks about creativity. Taking something that didn't naturally go together, putting it together to produce something new. That's why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I took some stuff together, put it together, and created something new. Come on. So it speaks about creativity. Wheat is symbolically the word of God. Let's talk about the wine. It is used to make a drink. First, the wheat is used to make a grain, and then a flour, and then and then turn into to uh, a bread. Rather, uh, gra grapes are used to make one. Uh, I'm sorry, to use, grapes are used to make a drink. It speaks about transformation. The first part, this one right here, she speaks about creativity. This one here, the wine, speaks about transformation because the Word of God does transform you. Wine is symbolically speaking about the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God, the, you, you, you were led by the, God, the Spirit of God when God draws you near and when, God, when you were led of the Holy Spirit, when God pulls you in, you are then transformed and reborn from one something into another, from faith to faith to glory to glory, and to a new man. And you can't get saved unless the Spirit draws you in. So wine speaks about the transformation, which is the very Spirit of God. It talks about the transformation from one thing to another. Let's talk about the oil. The oil is used to make seasoning. Also to make uh, oil. And it speaks about confirmation. Because then you would use the, that oil... And then you pour it over the head over somebody to confirm what God is doing or to confirm God's choice. Oil is symbolically speaking about the supernatural power of God. So then we've got the wheat, the wine, and the oil, and the process of it all. We're talking about the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the power of God. So when we look at wheat, what happens is, there's a transitioning from a plant, from that grain, uh, from the wheat stalk, to flour. Oh, by the way, look at that picture. If you notice there, that these wheat stalks, right, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that wheat stalk right here, it's bending over because the weight of the fruit of those kernels causes this wheat stalk to bend. But if you notice, those stalks that are sticking straight up right there, can't, is, isn't it kind of easy to tell? Those stocks that are sticking up versus the ones that are bending over, it's easy, right? You can tell. This is why the scripture says, Jesus is talking about, shall we go now? And he goes, no, 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 wait till harvest and then remove the tares from the wheat. And the way you can tell the tear or the weed from the wheat, the kernel, the, the, the good part, is because during harvest time, that wheat stock bends over as if it's bowing before the Lord. While that tear stands straight up in all of its, its, its pride and arrogance. 
He said is at that point in time, he goes, if you if you pull them all together, you're gonna take out some good stuff with some bad stuff. Wait till harvest because only at harvest, it's only at that time you are then able to uh, 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 successfully wheat up and pull up the tares and leave the wheat there. It's a beautiful thing. But that picture is a beautiful example of how some people are so prideful and arrogant while there are others who are bowing before the Lord. Remove those things which are prideful and arrogant and what remains is the fruit of God and the power of his word. So we see the wheat kernel from what you see from this stalk needs to transition from that plant to a grain to flour. It is then beaten and tested on a threshing floor. And by the threshing floor, what I mean is that they'll basically take um get this as an example. This is not just the threshing floor. And I put all my little wheat kernels. This piece, I'm going to throw a bunch of wheat kernels on my little threshing floor. And what happens is I go like this. And when I do like that, because of the weight of the wheat kernels, they're going to fall right back down here on, 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 my, on, my, on my mat here, my threshing mat. Now, because of when I go like this, here, here, let me go to a perfect example. You notice it comes right back down again, right? Right? But when the wind is blowing, when I go like this, the wind is going to blow away the shaft or the, the back part. It's going to blow away all that stuff that just that wants to hang on to the wheat. It just blows it all away. And so what remains, the chaff, that's what's called the chaff. The chaff is the stuff that blows away the wind. The stuff that comes back down on, the, on my threshing mat are the actual good wheat kernels. Everything else is being tossed away. But before that happens, i got to beat these kernels. Beat it down, beat it down, beat it down, beat it down, beat it down. And when I beat it down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break up the chaff from the actual wheat kernels. And that way, when I'm beating and beating and beating and go, whoop, whoop, all the chaff will blow away. And what falls back down to the mat are the, the good fruit, the good uh, 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 wheat kernels that are used to make the grain, that makes the flour, that makes the bread. That is symbolic of the word of God. And it produces a new product called Lechem, bread. And there's a whole city called House of Bread, which is Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And Jesus is the bread or the word of life. Let's do wine. Wine transitioned from the, is transitioned from the grape. The bread or the wheat is transitioned from the wheat kernel. Wine is transitioned from the grape. The grape is then beaten and tested by being stepped on and pressed on. Come on, somebody. Have you ever felt like that? You've been pressed on and stepped on and just squished and just, just abused by somebody putting their fist and their, their heel upon you? It produces wine. And Jesus is that new wine of life. And we can kind of go back and play with this a little bit because we've got... The word of God, which is Jesus, which is also the bread. And then we've got the wine of God, which is basically the spirit of God. So you've got like basically his body and his spirit. And it is in that, where the spirit of God and the very presence of God, Jesus being the word of God, is when Jesus said, here, take of me. And this is my bread, which is, which is the body, which is the body of Christ, which has been broken for you. Partake of this, eat this, this is my body. And then he says, my wine. He goes, the Partake of this because the wheat was beaten down and the wine was pressed down and beaten down. He's actually going through the process himself of wheat and wine. Come on, somebody. Ha! He's actually going through that process of explaining to you, take my bread and take my wine, which came from me because I've been like that bread. I've been beat down and abused. I'm also like that wine, which has been stepped on. And abuse. And I want you to partake of this new stuff I got coming out. God is so good. And 
Now let's do oil now. Transition from the olive. So the wheat kernel, or the, oh, I'm sorry, well the bread, or, or even the wheat has been trans transitioned from the wheat kernel. The wine is transitioned from the grape. Oh, I'm sorry, the bread is transitioned from the wheat. The grape is transitioned into the wine. And the olive is transitioned into the oil. What do you got to do with the olive? You got to take that olive, you just test it and try it by beating it and grinding it and squeezing it to death in the mill. Ever felt like that? You've been beat down like bread, squished and stepped on like wine, and then grinded and <laughs> squeezed to death like an olive? You're producing wheat, wine, and oil. The Holy Spirit is that oil of gladness. So we can see how the wheat, the wine, and the oil are, are byproducts or, or the, the results of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the power of God. Or God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They, they all work with that combination of those three produce, which is the Spirit of God, the power of God, and the Word of God. Now, this is interesting now. Understanding, let me just stop it real fast. Understanding that the very uh, connections or the connotations of when you are reading this for the first time, you are getting this picture in your mind. You you are getting it as you as you're being a, a Jew, understanding. Ah, okay, yeah, okay. So I see the wheat, I see the wine, I see all. So what when Joel is speaking, he's speaking to a bunch of people who have been beat down, who have been squished, stepped on, pressed, and squeezed of their very livelihoods and their very lives. So he's talking relationally to them, so they can go aha. I know exactly that. Well, yeah, I'm there. I'm there with you. I'm, I'm there with you. He was basically saying, God is saying, he knows what you are going through. So he's going to provide you the wheat, the wine, and the oil. Now, that being said, you understand that, that, that connection. Now, I don't care where you live at in Israel, you know somebody who's a, who's a farmer, who's, or, or you, you know the process of the wineries, uh, of the farmers, and, and the olive oil. That's all over the country, all over the country. So, yes, somebody in your family was a part of this or did something like that. And so there's a connection. There's a, re a relational connection to it to where you can go, I get it now. I get it now. I get it now. So they are getting this. They are understanding it because he's speaking the lingi. Or the lingi. He's speaking the lingi. He's speaking the language from that from those people. He's speaking the culture to them, back at them. So they're, under, they're getting this left and right. And then, then it goes on even a little bit deeper. We read in Second Chronicles two fifteen. Second Chronicles two fifteen says, "Now therefore the wheat, and look at this, and the barley, and oil." So it's been switched, where it was um, oil, but then we see barley. I'm sorry, wine. It's been switched with the barley. So you think like, well, that's that that's 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 key because, like I told you, they all understand about the wheat, wine, and oil. That's a typical phrase. But when you say wheat, barley, and oil, that's a shift. That's a change. And it says, now therefore, the wheat and the barley, the oil and the wine. I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Barley is added, and the wine is not switched. It's added. Um, the wheat, the barley, the oil, and the wine, which my Lord has spoken of, let him send unto his servants. So he's adding something to it. He's adding something to the wheat, wine, and oil. He's adding barley to it. Now, here's why. Barley is considered a poor man's grain. If you don't have a farm, if you don't have a lot of uh, financial means, then pretty much you, 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 can grow some, you can grow some barley. Every, every poor man has some barley. So this verse is showing us that you don't need anything special or costly in order to receive God's best for you, just show up. He added in barley because not everybody can afford wheat. But even the poor people were able to afford barley. Now, if we read now, like I told you, we see that that something like that repeated again. We are we read in the New Testament where five thousand people didn't have any food to eat. But a little kid, a little kid, the Bible says, had two barley loaves. And it's specifically mentioned barley. 
Why didn't he just say two loaves of bread? We see other translations that say two loaves of bread, but one one particular uh, uh, version story says two barley loaves and two small fish, basically sardines. So he had the poorest. He had a lunchable. He had a lunchable. You know, lunchables are those two little cute little things. He had the cheapest, like, insignificant pieces of bread, and he had two small, tiny sardines. This is a small kid. He's not going to be walking around with a big old tuna in his hands. He's going to be walking around with the two little sardines and a little piece of ghetto barley bread. That's what he had. Can you understand? Can you get that picture now? It's a little bit more than just because we think, and I think there was a one TV show or a TV variation of it. So this big old huge like loaf of uh, French loaf bread and these big old fish. No, 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 no. He had two small sardines and a little tiny barley. And is it that little tiny barley? Because he was a poor kid. God was saying that the, what the parable, what the parable was saying, and the message was being across. God took a poor kid's means, a little tiny, poor, smallest portions from the poorest person, and was able to be a blessing to many. Many people, because God doesn't care about where you came from. God doesn't care about uh, uh, what kind of leverage lifestyle you mean. He'll take your little bit that you got. He'll take your poor man's ghetto, smallest, tiniest little lunchable, and feed millions and millions of people with the smallest, little, insignificant, tiniest, little, smallest, minute thing you got and bless people. You don't have to have it all. You don't have to have the richest, most wealthiest education. You don't have to have the biggest or the brightest house. You don't have to have the shiniest or most glamorous car. You just got your little Yugo, your little 1972 Ford, 1974 Pinto, and your little, you know, 85 octane gas to go pick somebody up to be a blessing to them. It doesn't matter what you, what op, uh, vehicle or object you have with that. God can take the most insecure, obscure, minuscule, tiniest little thing and cause that thing to be a blessing if put into the right hands. It does not matter. So the scripture in Second Chronicles says, Now therefore the wheat and the barley... Because God is not going to leave anybody out. The oil and the wine, which the Lord has spoken of, let him send unto his servants. A very powerful, powerful revelation about the goodness of our God. Hidden in plain sight. So, putting this all together. Putting this all together, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged to know that God, as we go into this new year, a new a new year in Christ, a new year of the Lord, where the teaching you got was okay. It came like light rain. But now the light, the latter, the, the next teaching coming, the teaching that's coming now, the I'm sorry, the teaching that you had. Well, it was cute. It was, you know, it got got you and I to where we are, and it felt like a light rain upon us. But there is something more richer, something more eloquent, something more pronounced, something more, well, more revelation, more power is coming. That rain is coming, and here's why: the reason why it's so significant is the former rain, which was just looking at the culture, was around springtime, it March, late April, uh, like. Between March and April, that rain that produces the the spring crops, that's cute. It's it's fine because it, you know after the winter you want something to grow. So okay. So what happens is that little light rain you see in the springtime that causes flowers to grow back up in the springtime. That's the former rain. But there's also a summer harvest when that rain comes in, generally around July and August, around that time frame between late like middle August, middle September, around that time frame, where that which is more of a more um. Uh, Heavier rain, probably the best way I could put it. More torrential rain. You know why? Because that harvest, the summer harvest, produces a more lofty crops. I mean, it produces more and more food. You know why? Because that needs to sustain you throughout the winter months. Good afternoon, everybody. So when you see the former rain get you to the summer, that summer harvest or the summer rains get you all through the winter. So that rain must be more stronger, must be more pronounced, must be more heavier, must be more meteor. That's probably the best way I could put it. Must be more meteor because you need the tor torrential rains to satiate the ground to produce the bigger crops so that your, your, your 
that's conversed out with new wine and your grapes will be this big and the olives will be this big and the wheat will be so big and so you can make enough bread, wine, and drinks to last you throughout the winter months. The latter rain is greater than the former rain because you're going to need to sustain you through those times when there's no harvest whatsoever. But it is in that the latter harvest is always considered the best harvest because the fruits are bigger. How about somebody? So God is saying what you had earlier got you through to now. But what's coming is going to get you through the bad times, the tougher months, because that revelation and that teaching is going to sustain you and be a blessing to you so that you can become a blessing to others. There is more than just coming. There's more than just a simple ah, la, 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 la. It's more of a da, 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 da that is coming. And it's in that da, 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 da. That's going to be more meaningful and powerful. Yes, this is why I'm sharing it with you because I'm letting you know what the Jews have always known this entire time. There's a greater teaching coming, a greater revelation coming than it was before. And it's in his latter revelation, the latter rain that is coming, that is happening, that is, I believe we're at the door, is going to sustain us, is going to elevate us, is going to change us with the word of God, the spirit of God, and the power of God. Ah, we are not going to be the same, but we're going to rise up because those who know their God... Those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. To do so, you've got to have the fruits within you. The fruits are produced by the rain. The rain is produced by the teaching. The teaching is produced by the latter rain that is now coming upon us. Here is now the kicker, the peace that resists haunts to this whole thing. As we put this whole thing together, the confirmation part. Numbers 18, 12 says these words. All of the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat, the first fruits of them which they shall offer unto the Lord, them I have given thee. Let me give you another translation. For example, when the Israelites bring me the first batches of oil, wine, and grapes, you can have the best parts of those gifts. You're probably saying, wow, I didn't know that right about now. All of the best of the oil, all of the best of the wine, and of the wheat, the first fruits of them which shall offer it to the Lord, them I have given thee. What God is saying here is this. He gets the best of the best of the best. That comes to the Lord. That's offered to the Lord. God is saying, the best of the best of the best that they give me, I'm going to give it to y'all. They're going to give me their, their, their eloquent, their, their beautiful homes, their car. And I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm not on some prosperity thing. I'm just making a point. They're going to give me the best car they have the best house, the best location, and I'm going to give it to you. As I get the best, I'm giving my best to you. That's how special you are. And that's why he says, when I see what's going on and happening in the world, I'm going to give to you the best of the best. So you're not going to be shamed or in guilt or condemned. And then when you start to operate with the word of God, the spirit of God and the power of God. Oh, my God. You're going to change the world. You're going to change the world. Now, here's the caveat. You've got the word of God and you've got the spirit of God and you've got the power of God. So let's look at this from a natural point of view. If I've got wheat and I've got oil, which means I've got the word and I got power, I want to be a little bit more, what's the word? Condemning, because there's no spirit of God. If I've got wine and oil, which means the power of God and the spirit of God, but no word, I'm going to get weird and crazy. I'm going to be out there. They're going to call you some freak. If you've got the word of God and you've got the spirit of God, but no power, you're going to become legalistic. Good afternoon, everybody. 
You have to have all three. You have to have that balance because you don't want to be out of sync. If you got too much word and no power, you're going to be legalistic. If you've got power and the spirit but no word, you're going to become judgmental. If you've got spirit, the wine, and the oil, and no word, you're just going to be just, just you're going to be a hot mess. So that's why all three, all three are key. And by saying that, by re, by re revealing this to you, you're going to walk into a ministry, you're going to walk into church, and they, they immediately God's going to say, "There's no wine here, or there's no oil here, there's no word here, there's no wheat here." You're going to be able to discern that because that's been opened up to you now, and that gift. You, 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 I mean, and it could be that God is sitting here to provide the word, to provide the wheat, or God could be saying, I don't want you to come here because they're out of balance, they're out of whack. So it's it's also used for discernment, which is why he said, your young men will sing dream, have dreams, and young women, I'm sorry, uh, old men will have uh, uh, dream dreams, young men will have visions, because he's letting you know what these gifts, what these, this power I'm about to give you, you're going to be able to discern, detect, and display the power, the spirit, and the word of God, all three. The wheat, the wine, and the oil. And if you come from a lacquer, you know, lesser means, the barley will be added to you. And it doesn't matter because that's just an extra little kick to you because God is going to use you no matter where you come from and what you got going on in your life. God is going to use you exactly where you are. If you but just begin to partake of the wheat, the wine, and the oil, you've already paid a price for it. You've already had your wheat broken down and tossed up to and fro. You've already had been beaten down and squished and have somebody step on you. And you've already been grinded together and squeezed almost to death. You've already been through the process. Now for the transformation that comes, the transition time that comes out of you. The word of God that flows from you. The wine of God that comes pouring out of you. And the spirit of God that gets people saved. That's where the compassion level is at. You don't anoint people with wine. You don't confer people with word. You don't justify something in the scripture with, with wine. Just like you don't justify a, a demonstration of the Holy Spirit with wine. All three have its own unique skill set. But all three work together to produce harvest. Harvest. The best of the oil. The best of the wine. And of the wheat. The first fruits of them that shall offer to the Lord, them, all them, I have given to you. You now have that now. It has now been activated in your life, and now it's time to change the world. Any questions? Amen. So I'm going to pray right now then. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the wheat, the wine, and the oil, the word of God, the spirit of God, and the power of God, all three working in tension together, working in me and flowing through me. For we know, we know, we know, Lord, the price that you pay for us when they beat you, when they cut you open where they pressed you and squeezed you we understand when they beat you the word of the lord was released when they stepped on you and nailed you to the cross we understand and know that the wine was released and when they had you on the cross <clears throat> where they mocked you and then shoved the spirit aside is where the oil began to flow so you have demonstrated the wheat the wine and the oil on that day, that precious day, Lord, that produces new wine, fresh oil, and fresh baked bread that comes from the that comes like manna from heaven. Thank you, Lord. You now told us to partake, to eat of your wheat, of your bread, 
to drink of your blood of the wine. And it is in that that when we partake of the wheat and the wild that you add in your power, the oil, and then we are then changed from faith to faith to glory to glory. The transition period from the olive, from the wheat kernel, and from the grape changed to something different, something unique and something powerful. We thank you, Lord God, that we have made that transition from something <laughs> meek, something that just grows, something that is planted, and it's something that is powerful. We thank you, Lord God, that from this day forward, we are activated in the revelation and the teaching and the new greater teaching that is coming because you have given us the best. We receive that now in Jesus' name. Questions or comments? I have one. Oh, yes, please. I just wanted to thank everybody for praying for me. I am starting to feel a little bit better. Oh, amen. So, quick question. With the wheat and the wine on the oil, <laughs> who's going to be the first millionaire to activate it? I am. <laughs> Amen. That'd be Miss Pammy right there. Miss Pammy. Yeah. Amen. So I thank you guys for letting me what? have your Saturday afternoon. Wait, no more what? millionaires in the room? What? can't believe everyone's so silent. We're talking about a million dollars. I am. Okay. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, Come yeah. On. Amen. Amen. I'm glad to know y'all are alive out there. Man, I was getting worried. <laughs> Just know it's about to get gooder and gooder. Who, who is that? I see, is there somebody... Uh, hey, Jelsea, are you, were you saying something, Jelsea? Oh, we can't hear you. Ah, we lost her. Okay. All right. Oh, there she is. Hi. All right, so I guess was, I, maybe she's driving. Oh, I'm here. I was trying to type, but I'm driving. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I don't want you to crash. Yeah, yeah I'm here. <laughs> I'm also going to be the next billionaire. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm going to get you. No, that's okay. I've been enjoying. I've been listening to everything. Thank you for that teaching. Oh, amen. 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 Awesome. So thank you guys so much. And then we will see you when. Oh, gosh. Wait, 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 wait. Um, I don't know what time we arrive. In, we we arrive in Seattle, but if it's early enough because it's West Coast time, then we'll we'll probably uh, 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 go live in, from Seattle uh, on Wednesday. So well, our flight our flight takes off at five. I don't think we're gonna land. I think we're landing at nine in Seattle. So I think the meeting will be over. I think we're gonna. Oh, okay. And we're also not going to be speaking on Saturday because that's exactly the same time as Jonathan's wedding. So, okay. But yes, Beatrice, we will take pictures. <laughs> Amen. All right, then. So then, uh, then maybe we'll, maybe if we can squeeze in some time in that, then definitely uh, after that we will we'll, we'll be right back on right back on track. So, but we love you guys. Oh, we, please enjoy your three day weekend. Um. And we will see you guys soon. Shalom. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a great weekend. You too. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs>